Jacob. Nice to meet you all, sort of. It's a little weird because you're there and I'm here. Um, I, want, I want you to stand up before I start. I know you just sat down and you were like, I was just getting ready, but like, up. Okay, I'm gonna talk uh, a lot about what I think the next generation of infrastructure is. And I, I put in a talk title, it's called The Evolution of Automation. And the thing I realized as I was thinking about that topic was uh, that in order to talk about it, I had to actually talk about a bunch of feelings-y stuff instead of a bunch of technology stuff. So I'm gonna talk about a bunch of feelings-y stuff. And when I do that, I'm gonna use words like you and we and I and that sort of thing. But really what I'm talking about is you. So whenever I use any of those words, it's like the royal you. So if it sounds, if I say something and you're like, that doesn't apply to me, uh, it super does, and I'm talking to you. Does that make sense? Everybody's cool? Okay, sit down. So I think everyone in this room, uh, regardless of where you work, if you work in a tiny startup, if you work in a big web company, if you work in a giant enterprise, uh, we're all on this journey to figure out how it is that we can do a better job uh, helping our customers have better experiences and better lives, right? And those customers, sometimes they're internal, sometimes they're external, um, sometimes you can see them, sometimes you can't, but we spend a really disproportionate amount of time, if you think about it, on the infrastructure and on the setup and on just all of the stuff that we do to, to, to run all the things that get that stuff out to those customers. And when we look at the struggle that we're all going through to figure out how to, to do that better, what we're really doing is trying to build these high-performing teams. All of us want to figure out how are we going to come together, how are we going to build teams that work together to deliver that stuff better, faster, smarter, more fun, right? All of those sorts of things. And software helps us to do that. So it's not just us as people working better together as teams, it's also the technology that we use trying to reinforce the behaviors that, that, that allow us to get that stuff done at the, at the software level. And while we're doing that, we tend to run into to, to a problem, and I, I call this problem the production cliff. And so, to illustrate this, it's, it's pretty simple. Let's pick a technology. Let's do Docker. Anybody here use Docker? Right? Of course you do, because it's Docker. Um, so, and odds are high, you picked up Docker in the last year. How many people picked up Docker in the last year? The same set of hands. Okay, so, so here's what your experience probably was for Docker. This one was mine. So you start out and you pick up Docker and you type Docker run IT some piece of software you wanted. And then you hit enter and then it runs. And you were like, yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> like it downloaded an operating system and like I had a service in it and like it, it ran. And that was what I wanted. It's what I always wanted. The time that I typed like yum install Redis, what I wanted was Docker run IT Redis and now I'm happier. Like things were cooler and you were like, this is the best. And so then you start climbing up this hill here, right? and it gets a little more difficult, you're like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not got services in five Docker containers, but I got Compose, and like you start piling stuff on, and it feels pretty good, and you get to what I call the peak of false hope. So the peak of false hope is that little arrow, right? <laughs> and the peak of false hope is the moment where you think you've seen all there is to see. You're like, I got it, Docker, check, right? And then you're like, you know what, Docker's rad. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna go to production. You guys ready? Let's hit production. This could be Chef. It doesn't have to be Docker. It could be, uh, it could be anything. It doesn't matter, right? I know this happens with Chef, so I'm not picking on Docker unnecessarily. My own software, I wrote it 10 years of my life. This will happen to you too. Okay, so you're up at the top, and you're like, this is amazing. And then you're like, let's go to production. And then it's like, oh no, right? Immediately the shenanigans begin, where it's like, well, what about this? What about that? What about this thing? Hey, how does that work? Does this thing scale? Is that highly available? How will this work? And you sort of go through this list and it starts to go down. You're like, oh, maybe I didn't see everything that there was to see. And then you, you hit the bot, you hit what you think is, is, you're like, okay, it gets a little easier actually. Like there's that first bump and then it's like, huh, okay, it's gonna be okay. I'm going to production. We're gonna do 150. Oh, that worked, 150 is good. And then you're like, okay, let's go to the data center. And then like it just skyrockets in difficulty, right? Um, and, and that difficulty is a real, real challenge for us as an industry because when we think about how our software is built, that thing happens for every single piece of software that we build, all of them, and that's, that's, that's pretty tough. This is Dark Souls 3. How many people here have played Dark Souls 3? <laughs> okay, if you're, if you're not a video game person, Dark Souls as a series exists to sort of be mean to you. 
like, like if you, like I grew up playing video games, I grew up playing like Nintendo, and there were those Nintendo games that were super hard, like Bionic Commando, where like people either figure it out or they don't, and people who didn't figure it out are like, what a stupid game with a little guy with a little arm. And like then people who figure it out were like, this is the best game I've ever played, it's so hard. Um, Dark Souls 3 is like that. And this dude in the red over here, I'm the guy in the, in the left basically with the silver armor, and that guy with the red is a bad guy. And that guy kicked my ass for 24 full hours. <laughs> and he's not a boss. He's just a dude. He's just like a, it's, it's literally like if you were playing Super Mario Brothers and one of those little mushrooms just beat the crap out of you for 24 hours, right? And I, I it was so hard. And it was, and I just could not figure out what I was doing wrong. And it was just, it was brutal and awful. And so I stayed up for like a whole day. I have a kid and you know, I like ignored them. My family, I was like, I'm gonna kill this goddamn night, right? And I get to the end and I do it. 24 hours and it's late at night. You know, my family's asleep and I kill that night. And I was, man, it felt so good. <laughs> like, um, I remember what it felt like when my daughter was born, this felt like that. It was like, yes, you know, like I had done, I had made an accomplishment in my life, right? And, and I talked about it the next day. I went back and I was like, have you played Dark Souls 3? This is the best game you've ever played. Now, meanwhile, this game abused me for 24, like, I was not, it wasn't fun, right? But because I triumphed, I felt amazing. I was like, this was great. And now I get to go to conferences and I get to talk about how much I liked Dark Souls 3 because this dude beat me up. And that's the same thing we sort of do when we think about deploying stuff like Chef or like Docker or all those things. We get up in front of our peers and we talk about the incredibly difficult hill we climbed. And then we're like, you can run Docker production. It's easy. I do it. What's, what's the problem? I rolled it, right? And it's because we love things that are hard, right? It's not just, we don't like simple things. Everybody can do simple things. What we like and what we talk about and what we want to share is when we overcome difficult things. But I'm not talking about the kind of fun, like Dark Souls 3 is a great video game and I did actually really enjoy it. And you do feel really good when you deploy Docker production, but I'm not talking about that kind of difficulty. I'm talking about the difficulty where you will spend time away from your family, where, you're, where that pit of your stomach is eating you up with stress because you're worried that this decision you made will ruin months and months of effort in your multi-billion dollar company. It will ruin the startup that you took money from and the financiers that you took the cash from and the people that you hired and they won't have jobs anymore. I'm talking about the stress where how many people have had a fight uh, with your significant other uh, simply because you were stressed out of work and they were the person you loved the most and it felt safe to take it out on them, right? That's the worst of me. Like, I, I don't like that person, but that person happens when the equivalent of Dark Souls 3 is happening to me at my job. How many people here have said you hate software in the last 30 days? Yeah, 60? 90 days? Anybody not raise their hand? Okay, I was just looking. You're a liar. <laughs> um, okay, so there's a Zen story about a man on a horse, and he's galloping along on this horse, and he's going really fast, and he sees his buddy at the crossroads, and he yells out to his buddy. He goes, hey, or the buddy yells at the guy on the horse. He goes, hey, where are you going? And the guy yells back, I don't know, ask the horse. And there's no laughs? Come on, it's funny. <laughs> it's Zen, it's supposed to, you're supposed to laugh later. Okay, so the, the thing is that in this story, the horse is technology, right? It's going where it wants to go, and we are, we're along for the ride. And this guy is Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh is a Vietnamese uh, Buddhist monk. Uh, he wrote an incredible book. Uh, it's called The Miracle of Mindfulness. It's a collection of letters that he wrote back uh, to his brothers. Uh, during the Vietnam War when he was exiled about how to remain mindful in the midst of horrific destruction and death. And this incredible human being who was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize by Martin Luther King spoke at Google. That's how weird the world is. And um, this is what he had to say. He said, if technology can help you to go home to yourself and take care of your anger, to take care of your despair, take care of your loneliness, if technology helps you to create joyful feelings, happy feelings for yourself and your loved ones, it's gonna be going in a good way and you can make good use of technology. And I think that what, what he's talking about here is that we have a choice. We can either take control of that horse and we can decide intentionally what the technology is that we're gonna build and how we're gonna build it and the impacts it has on our lives or it will do that for us and we probably won't be happy with the results. And software is a part, but not all of who we are. 
And the thing that will get us to the next place, the thing that will get us to the next level, that will change the way we think about how we work, and that will change the way that we do that work, um, is to think intentionally about the software that we build, and to think intentionally about the culture we build around that software. And I think that ultimately we need to strive to build humane systems. And these are systems that show compassion for ourselves and show compassion for other people. They show benevolence and grace um, for us and for other people. And by grace, I mean when people don't understand or when they struggle, we, un we, we give them space and we help them through and we get them to the place they need to be. When, when our technology falls down and isn't what it needs to be, we find a way to, to make it better. And then ultimately, the systems we build, the technology we build, has to help us to become better. If the technology we're using doesn't reinforce the behaviors we want to see in ourselves and the behaviors we want to see in others, then it's bad technology and we need to replace it. And ultimately, we're not going to get where we're going uh, with the patterns of how we've gotten here, right? We have roughly 30 years, 40 if you stretch it, um, of history of IT ever, period. Um, and in that same path that we took to get here, uh, we will not get to the next phase of where we're going. And luckily, we have everything we need to be really innovative at this moment in history. We have perspective, we have history, there's a ton of cross-disciplinary activity. We have stuff we need to invent a better future. And so if we want to do that, it starts with our culture, and then it goes to our technology. And both of those things reinforce the people in the middle. So human beings go to work, you do your thing. Think about if you wanted to change uh, the speed with which you deliver software in your company, you wanted to make it easier to deploy so that there were less shenanigans and better for your customers, and you didn't have to have fights all the time, uh, but you were refused to change any of your foundational technology, how do you think that project's gonna go, <laughs> right? Like, it's gonna go terribly badly. And you see this all the time, where you know a company, thinks, uh, a company decides that they need to compete and they need to go faster, but they refuse to look at their security and compliance policy, right? What do you think's gonna happen? Like, it's all gonna fall apart, because it's this reinforcing cycle. So I think if we're gonna build better software and build better things, it's actually a very simple way to do it. This is a thing called Ubuntu, not the operating system, but the spirit of uh, more of the philosophy. And it's very, very simple. It just is, I am because you are, right? And its corollary is when you suffer, I suffer, and when you thrive, I thrive. And this is a very simple, uh, very African idea. And at its root, what's beautiful about it and why I think it can be helpful in the way we build software is this. No one has to take a certification. You don't have to go to a class. You don't have to go to a retreat. You don't need to go to a DevOps days. If all you did was sit in your job and think to yourself, is what I'm doing causing other people to suffer? Am I, am I alleviating their burden or am I adding to it, right? And if they're hurting, then that's gonna come back on me someday. And like, we're not getting, we're not progressing to where we need to be. That's how you know that you're going in the right direction. So from there, you have to build systems that are inclusive. I'm gonna kind of breeze through this slide because I don't have a ton of time, but this leads us to this idea of building inclusive organizations. And an inclusive organization is like, uh, we talk about inclusion and diversity, and we often do it in the same sentence. Inclusion is the soil, and diversity is the kinds of plants that are inside of it, right? So it's really difficult to have a great garden if, you, if it's not good soil, right? In the same way, it's very difficult to be diverse if you're not inclusive. And so Jay Goosby Smith wrote a book called Beyond Inclusion, uh, and she puts forth this idea of Ubuntu inclusion, and she has these nine things. So people need, in order to feel included, people need to be connected to something bigger. Uh, they need to mutually agree that they're gonna include each other. So you have to include yourself in the process of being included. You have to communicate what's happening with yourself, with the organization, with how you're feeling. You have to mentor other people and develop their potential. You have to care uh, about each other. You have to care about what happens. You have to care about things when they're difficult and when people are suffering. You have to be fair. Um, Work-life balance is a good example here. Um, can your boss take twice as much vacation as you? If so, that's weird, right? Um, visibility. Um, you have to give people a chance to be highly visible and to have high stakes and to take real risk. If you're a manager and the people who work for you never have a chance to make a decision that you think might be wrong, uh, then you're probably failing at giving them enough visibility to stand up and, and really own their work. And then finally, you have to give people a chance to talk. Uh, about what they have done and be the face of the organization and be the face of its values. And those are the things that make people feel included. And you can do that in software too. Diversity, if inclusion is the soil, diversity is the plant. You need both. Um, and often we're good at one but not the other, right? So often we're good at being inclusive and we're bad at being diverse. And there's a bunch of reasons why. 
The simplest and most charitable answer is simply that we tend to have social networks that look like us or that come from where we come from, right? Um, there's more complicated and probably more true answers to that that are more systemic. And the truth is, as, a, as, as people, um, we have a responsibility to understand that we have to make an active effort uh, to be more diverse and to bring people and their points of view in. Because if we're gonna build software that's great, if the next evolution of software is software that works for us as people, if our definition of people is so narrow that it doesn't include all kinds of people with all kinds of backgrounds from all kinds of places, with all kinds of skin colors and sexual orientations and every possible thing in the universe, then we will build bad software for someone. Uh, we have to be team oriented. Uh, as creatures, we are a little herd animally, right? We're all packed into this room, we wanna hang out, we wanna go to a conference, we wanna go party later, right? And when we build systems and technology that build teams, we help bring each other together. Often, we build technology uh, that does not do that, right? We, try to, we talk about removing people from the loop. We talk about, uh, we talk about uh, being able to you know, have one person do the job of 50, those sorts of things. What we really need are systems that support and software that supports the orientation of teams. Um, human beings need context in order to survive, and in order to thrive. So it's that context that lets us learn about each other in a way that's deeper than simply sort of knowing each other's names. This is my family, that's my daughter Elizabeth, that's my wife Katie, um, and I'm gonna give you an example of building context-driven software. Uh, we, uh, my daughter is six, um, and we went to uh, an amusement park for the first time in her life, and that was amazing, and we went to a Six Flags, and what I didn't know about this Six Flags, I live in San Francisco, and if you don't know much about the Bay Area, it's not very hot, like it stays sort of in a band between like 62 and 75, like all year, right? And so we go to Six Flags, and it's gonna be awesome, and half the park are water rides. And we were completely unprepared for water rides. There are no bathing suits or towels or change of clothes or anything, right? But my daughter is six, and she's like, water rides, that's amazing, we are going to get so wet, right? And I'm like, yes we will! And so we go on this giant water ride, and it's got the big log ride, it does a thing, and we go up to the top, and then we come down, and we hit the bottom, and I get fucking soaked. <laughs> like, we're not like a little bit wet, like, my underwear is wet, right? And I'm like, who designed this fucking ride, <laughs> right? But my daughter's like, that was amazing, we're so wet! And I'm like, yeah, that's 64. And so, so we get off this like awful log plume of hate, and, and then there's this bridge that goes over the part where the log splashes down. It's like the second chance to soak your stupid ass, right? And if anybody has a little kid, the thing little kids will do is run away from you. Like that's just sort of their jam, especially the amusement parks, man, they'll just book. And so, so she starts booking it across this bridge with no regard whatsoever for the log flume that's like coming to destroy her. And I try to like rescue my daughter like an idiot, right? And so I like turn around and the one part of me that's dry is my back, you know, cause I was sitting in a chair. Man, and that log flume just poof. And so she is like fine and I'm soaking wet my entire body. And so we are then standing in like this giant human air conditioner that tried to dry me off. And my wife is like, this air conditioner thing is not gonna work, this is shenanigans. I'm gonna go buy us some clothes. And so she goes off and she buys me that stunning wolf shirt. <laughs> and um, and my, my little kid has this like arbitrary cartoon character because we were at a Six Flags and they don't have cool characters. Well, it's DC, but Marvel's better. So, so here's the thing about that story. How many of you think you could tell that story in two days in summary? No one. Matt Stratton's like, I could tell it, I heard it once before. You'll remember, you showed, how many of you think you could do it if you saw this picture again? If the picture came up and you were like, what was that moment? You could do it. And the reason is, we've had a thing, right? Like, you would not remember that slide if it was just a slide in my deck. But you'll remember because I told you a story. You looked at me and I told you a thing about my life and my family and you understood it. That's what being context driven means. And so when you think about the software you develop and the way you run your teams, if your scrum process is handing someone a backlog they have to just feed off the end of for nine months, it's not very context driven. Why, did, what, why should they remember? Why do they know what it is that you actually want to accomplish with the people you want to do it with? So when you think about running your teams, when you think about building your software, you have to think about it, how you're going to distribute that context to people. Okay. Uh, you have to embrace complexity. You know, people will tell you that um, we should get simpler, that we need simpler software. Those people are wrong. Um, 
that you actually, the arc of history tells us that we get more complex over time, um, not less complex. Here's a good example of what I mean. Uh, this is a Model T Ford. Who can drive a car? Everybody can drive a car? How many, who thinks they could drive a Model T? Yeah, okay, you're up front, so stand up. So, um, show me how you start a Model T Ford. Yeah, you turn the crank, that's a good answer. So I want you to remember that he said crank. So you're wrong, you can sit down. Um, so, so in our mythical Model T Ford, what he does is gets up, he cranks the Ford, the Ford does nothing. He's like, I'm cranking like a mother, nothing moves, right? So here's what you have to do. First, you have to prime the carburetor. You get out of the car, you reach down underneath it, there's a little thing you can pull on, like a little loop of wire, and you pull on that thing, and that opens up the choke. And then there's a little lever right next to it you can't actually see, and you turn that thing one half turn, and that floods the carburetor with gas. If you go one full turn, then it's flooded, you won't start. Okay, but you can't see any of this, right? It's underneath the car. Okay, so then you get back in the car. You're gonna set the ignition to magneto because you uh, haven't started the car recently. It's a Model T Ford, you don't drive it every day. And so if you wanted to drive it every day, you have to set it to battery. So you have to know, is it magneto or battery? So you're gonna go for magneto. You're gonna put the timing stock to up, you're gonna put the throttle down and the handbrake up. Now you'd think the handbrake told the car not to move. That's not what you're doing. You're actually setting it to neutral. Okay, and then, you're gonna start the car. So now you're gonna walk out, you're gonna crank the lever on the front. Now, uh, are you right-handed or left-handed? Right He's right-handed. So most likely, would you have cranked with your right arm? Yeah, you totally would have, me too. Now you broke your arm. So what happened is, <laughs> you got out in front of it and there's a crank and you went crank and then it backfired and it went and you, your arm broke. It went the wrong way and it broke your arm. Um, and that's a huge bummer. So you're like, oh my God, the Model T is the worst car. And then. Uh, so, you, so you learned that lesson because it broke your arm the first time, and so now you use your left arm. But then you have a second problem, which is the same thing. You have to let go of that goddamn crank if it backfires. And so normal humans grip things with our thumbs. That's like why society exists. But you cannot grip the crankshaft with your thumb. If you do that, then your left arm won't let go either, and you break your arm. So make sure you never grip with your thumb like a monkey. Okay, so here's the thing. That was a simpler car. If we locked these doors, we would build a Model T Ford. If there's just a pile of parts and some stuff, I bet with the knowledge in this room of internal combustion and basics of how a car works, we could get out of here with a car. We would not die in this room, right? But uh, that's not because it was easier, right? We could build it, it was simple, but it was not better, it was worse. And when things are easy, people are free to learn and grow in new directions. You can focus on what matters. This is my car. Uh, it has a button. That button says start. You know what's interesting about that? Um, they used to tell you, you put the key in the ignition. Why do I ignite my car? That's weird. You know what it should say? Start. And there should be a button and you should push it. And that's better. But it's undeniably more complex, right? So somewhere there's a dude and that guy is like, cars are too complex. It was better when they were simpler. And that person's wrong. And the same thing happens when people say that to you about your infrastructure. You should be absolutely willing to trade complexity for ease, right? If it makes your life better, if it makes things easier, if it moves us forward, take some complexity, man. Don't just, st don't, don't, don't mythologize the era where you had to break your arm because you climbed the hill, okay? Now that doesn't mean that we need to build things that aren't maintainable. So when things go wrong, you have to be able to quickly address what's there. Otherwise, you're in this trap. It's complicated, I don't understand how it works, I can't fix it when it's broke. So this is a, a, a Ford Fusion, and it's a stock car. And so what's cool about stock car racing is that that's basically the car you could buy on the street. Um, and the thing about it is that car has a few things you could easily tweak. For example, traction control and anti-lock braking. You can turn them on and turn them off. They have a button, you push them. Those are the things that most human beings have to change about the way their car drives. There's also a computer where if you're a mechanic, you can get into the computer, you can change everything about the car. You can change the engine timing, you can do all kinds of magical tweaky things. That is a maintainable car, and that's what you're striving to build in your complex systems. Different people, different actors in the system need different levels of access, and they need different points of view across the software you build. But if it's not easy in the end, it's not worth it. Okay, when you're building your software, you have to be willing to dive deep. Um, you can't only take what is as a hard constraint. And this, for me, in the last year or two, I built a thing called Habitat, and I'd love to talk about it later. Um, and I learned a lot about going deep in the building of Habitat in the name of making things easier for people. Um, an example there was we wound up building our own distributed gossip layer in order to handle service discovery 
uh, between and a bunch of other events between these supervisors that manage services. And I didn't want to build that. Like I thought that was silly. The truth was I couldn't give you the user experience I wanted if I didn't build it. I had to be willing to dive deep enough to get there. You have to stay grounded in reality. So while I'm telling you to go deep, that doesn't mean you can just destroy everything you have in the name of going deep, right? Because not everything you have is garbage. So a good example is if you were hired to be the city planner for the city of Chicago, and you came in and your very first day, what you said was New York City is the best city. And so what we're gonna do is bulldoze the city of Chicago and we're gonna rebuild New York right here. You can imagine Central Park, only it's next to the lake, right? And think like, you know, we could have a new, you know, uh, Empire State Building. Who needs the Sears Tower? No one cares about the Sears Tower, right? They would throw you out and kick you in, just, you'd be done. They'd bury you, they would fit Chicago, right? Um, <laughs> so here's the thing. Um, we do this all the time in technology. We literally, how many times have you sat in a meeting where someone's big plan was burn it to the ground? <laughs> okay, don't do that, it's done. Okay, you need to leverage principles uh, that, that already exist and that we have learned in our 30 year history. We are not new at this, although we are young at it relatively, right? We have a long and pretty distinguished history that we can draw on outside of IT, philosophy, law, justice, um, object-oriented programming, functional programming, service-oriented architecture, microservices, all of these things, they're great. One thing, one mistake we make is we ascribe the value of the principles we have to the technology. You have to remember your users, all of them. And I have, I think there's really three. There's builders, operators, and consumers. And if you think about those three different classes of users, that will help you. So I submit that we should take control of the horse. We should consciously, intentionally build the future that we desire of our technology and of our culture. And if we don't, then I think we condemn ourselves and others uh, to go through that same cycle of pain and difficulty and, and distress uh, that we have gone through in our careers. And I think instead we should build humane software that has compassion for ourselves and for each other. And I think we should start here at DevOps Days, and we should start in the companies that you work for, and you should start in the people uh, that you can see with your eyes. And I think you should refuse to settle uh, when you find yourself in situations where, they're, where it's not humane, where the work you're doing isn't good, where the software you're working with isn't right, where the people you work with are, 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 aren't thinking correctly uh, about how we should build and, and, and work together. Because you're not stuck. You can go anywhere, you can do anything. And we should be bold about the choices we make. You should be willing to, to, to really think hard and to make difficult choices in the name of improving our lives. And I want you to stand up one more time. And I want you to say it with me. I am because you are. I am because you are. When you suffer, I suffer. When you suffer, I suffer. When you thrive, I thrive. When you thrive, I thrive. Thank you. <laughs>